Hello everyone. In this video, I'd like to talk about the basics of stress and strain. So to talk about stress and strain, first we need to review what is, uh, what are the, the primary loads that we're thinking about. Um, so the types of loads that we could expect to find in a rigid body. So I'm going to go ahead and start writing that down. So typically we have uh, several types of loads and we might be looking at axial shear bending moment and torsion. And recall that we had kind of some basic um, variables that we used for each of these. So P for axial, V for shear, M for bending moment, and T for torsion. <clears throat> so then for each of these, we can think about, well, what stresses would result uh, from the application of these loads. So if I take each of these four loads, I can say, well, uh, an axial load is going to result in a normal stress due to that axial load. And use my, my notation, uh, Greek letter sigma, for uh, normal stress, and typically give it a little subscript A. We have sometimes what we call direct shear for the application of a shear force. Shear stress, then, uh, using the letter tau, subscript V to refer to the, the application of direct shear. Bending moment also results in a normal stress. And we can give that a label sigma sub b. And finally, we have torsional shear tau sub t. So we have these four possible stresses, two of them being in the normal direction, normal uh, meaning normal to the, to the cross-sectional surface, um, and then the shear stresses being parallel to the surface. So when we make that imaginary cut in a rigid body, if we have this cut plane, normal is going to be stresses that are uh, into or out of the surface, and shear stresses are going to be in the plane of that, that cut. So let's start with our axial stress. So axial stress, as you might expect, if we have an arbitrary rigid body, and on this rigid body I have forces in equal and opposite directions, and then I'm going to make a cut internal to that uh, rigid body. And I'm going to pick a side of that, doesn't really matter which, and say, OK, I have a force that's still applied to this end. And of course, uh, we know then that there has to be an equal and opposite um, internal force, uh, in which case would be that axial. And we can represent that because really how it's represented then as, as a stress which is distributed across that surface. So this axial stress sigma sub a, you know, given that we know what axial stress looks like, is going to look like something like this. Force uh, F, which is that applied load or, or whatever, you know, label we've given it, uh, divided by that area. So it's a pressure, it's a stress, it's a force distributed over an area. Uh, and that's pretty straightforward. And again, it's uh, drawn in this direction, which is normal to the surface, meaning it points into uh, and out of that, that surf into or out of that surface. And we would consider this to be like an average stress uh, across that surface, right? Which um, falls under the assumption that it's uniformly distributed um, in that, 
its equivalent basically at any point along that surface we would assume that it's uh, an equivalent stress so next if I can scroll down here a little bit talk about direct shear so shearing um, at least uh, for me the easiest way to think about shearing is to think about it like a scissors cutting a piece of paper right if I have a scissors which I don't have in front of me and I have a piece of paper I can imagine what's happening here right I have a, a the two sides to my to my scissors and when those blades pass next to each other uh, basically touching each other but very very close next to each other it cuts through the paper right and that uh, is the best example I can give of of a shearing type motion so if I have my some arbitrary rigid body and I have two um, other rigid bodies which I say I might apply a load to and this one is offset on this side basically at the same interface point where these two uh, right hand side of the top one left hand side of the bottom um, rectangle and we're applying a, mo a force to each of those to to kind of push them past each other then if we take a, a look at uh, this location make a cut imaginary cut through here uh, and represent that as a free body diagram I could say okay I'm looking at the left hand side of this rigid body I have a force P still applied right and again because it's in uh, equilibrium I need an equal and opposite force so the equal and opposite force has to be on that surface because that's the only thing left of an equivalent value of, of P now this is again a stress distributed over an area you know we know that that the units of stress are you know pounds per square inch or, or um, uh, newtons per meter squared so we distribute that stress over that surface and as a result we have a stress tau sub v equal to in this case p over that area that that cross-sectional area of my rigid body where i've made that cut and now i've labeled it p here just because that's what i labeled the load don't get that confused with axial load you know we might call this v for for um, shear in, in most circumstances but one thing we need to be careful about uh, and you may recall from you know if you've seen this before is that this shear stress is not distributed uniformly across the surface uh, what we would actually find and if I do another drawing here of my rigid body without putting my loads on it I would actually find that my sh well, that's a bad drawing but my shear stress is distributed as a parabolic function so greater in the center uh, and going to zero at the outer edges so in reality I have a, a, a parabolic curve on that surface which shows what my um, stress distribution is so on the top and bottom of my my rectangular rigid body that I have in my picture I would have zero shear stress and I would have greatest shear stress right in the middle so if I wanted to know my actual highest shear stress I would say it's four-thirds V over a or in this case P over a whatever I want to call it the shear stress I originally wrote which was just P over a I would call this an average shear stress and this four-thirds would be more like a max so it's uh, four-thirds so it's 33 percent greater at that center than what it would be uh, on average across that so it's some something that's pretty important to remember typically if we're interested in the shear stress as our failure mechanism we need to remember that it's four-thirds V over a uh, at that maximum center point now we also need to be careful that it's only at this this central axis um, if I kind of dash in a neutral axis here and you'll get why I call that a neutral axis in just a second that's where we would expect to find that max to occur if we're looking at only the top and the bottom then we have no shear stress and so we need to be careful about where we uh, locate our points now one other thing to think about when we talk about direct shear um, because it comes up a lot when we're talking about um, things that are subject to peer for uh, shear 
which would be like pins or, or bolts. Um, we can have what we might call single shear, which is say I have a bolt and I have something that's loaded. So this is a pin perhaps such that I have a force on this side and an equal and opposite opposing force on this side. So in this example, this bolt that's in the middle is holding these two plates together. Um, you know, it could be like a cotter pin or, or a, uh, a pin that holds like a trailer to a lawnmower or something like that. And when I look at this example, my shear stress as a result occurs where these two plates are, are together right on that bolt. There's one, one shear surface, one cross-sectional area where that force is applied. So then I can, you know, do the same thing I did before and say that my shear stress is that average, uh, as an average is F over A. However, I might also have the same example of a bolt and I have one plate here with a force applied to it. And then I have, I don't know what you want to call it, like a double, a cloved, clove? I can't remember. There's, some, there's a name for this, cloved or something like that, where I have two surfaces. So I have my four still applied here, but now this has a split and such that there's two sides to it, top and bottom around this other one, which is pulling this way. So that means that there's two surfaces, which I'm putting way too many lines on the screen here, but you hopefully get what I'm saying. There's two surfaces where this stress is being applied to my bolt. Now, what that means is when I go ahead and uh, write my shear stress, I have a force over an area but there's kind of two ways I can think about this. I have two cross-sectional areas, so I could say force over 2A, or I could also say, well, if I take this force back and, and cut this here, the force actually gets distributed one half of, over each area. So F over two divided by one area. So of course, both of these equations result in the same thing, right? It's F over A one half uh, multiplied by one half. So it ends up being half of the amount uh, of shear stress when it's split in this way. So sometimes we call this first example single shear, and we might call this second version double shear. Uh, so nothing's really changing other than in the double shear case, my shear load is applied over two different locations on the bolt. So the shear stress is in effect halved um, as it's applied to the bolt. All right. Next, I wanna talk about bending stress. So Using the, the simplest example, I take a rigid body and I apply a moment to it. So a bending moment, which is basically a, a torsion applied um, on equal and opposite sides. I have my moment, I have my equal and opposite moment on the other end. And the result of this is that if I you know exaggerate the deformation, I get something that looks like this. And you may have heard of this before. I have a neutral axis through the middle of this. And the reason we call this a neutral axis is because as I bend something and curve it in this way, you could see if you looked at the, say the top line and compared it to the bottom line, my top line is getting shorter while my bottom line is getting longer. So I'm compressing on the top and putting it in tension on the bottom and of course that implies that somewhere in the middle it has to be zero, right? If I have a positive, or excuse me, a negative on the top, um, because we typically say compression is negative, and I have a tension on the bottom, which we typically say is positive, then somewhere in the middle it has to be zero. And that's what we call the neutral axis. So it's the axis on which uh, the stress is, is zero. Now, 
when we uh, think about that then, we can go ahead and consider how that uh, means our stress is applied. So if I, again, make a cut any random place through the middle of here and look at that as a free body diagram and I have my neutral axis drawn in, I could look at the stress on this and say, well, on the top it's going to be negative in compression, zero at the neutral axis, positive at uh, the opposite end, and I can kind of draw in what my stress vectors might look like uh, on here. Um, so in this case, we what we see is that the stress is a maximum uh, at the in the positive direction at the bottom, and in the negative direction at the top, and it's zero at the middle at that neutral axis. Stress for bending then has the equation m y by i. Now, getting our, our notation, y in this case is considered to be distance from the neutral axis. So as I walk away my position from that neutral axis towards the upper or lower position, I would say that that's increasing my distance y. So it's a maximum at that top or bottom um, position. And therefore, you know, based on the equation, we can see, well, as y increases, the stress increases. So it, it all matches um, with our result uh, or with our equation, with our math. I, remember, is the area moment of inertia. And in effect, what area moment of inertia is, is resistance to bending. So it's the resistance of, of that part to, to bending. It's a, it's a geometric property. So it's dependent on the shape or the cross-sectional shape of my rigid body. So if I have a, a rectangle, that's gonna be one thing. If I have an I-beam, that's gonna be something else. And those are gonna have different area moment of, uh, moments of inertia. And I can calculate those. Usually the equations are something we look up, right? Um, back of the textbook style thing or somewhere online. Um, so we can look up what those area moment of inertia values would be and, and plug that in. All right. If you're following along, the last one that I need to talk about is our torsional shear stress. So torsional shear, again, just picking an arbitrary rigid body. Torsional shear is, is the stress that results from the application of a torque to something. So in this case, I have a torque applied to either end of a shaft, uh, and that torque results in a stress in between those two. Now if I, again, make a cut somewhere in the middle, and in this case, I'm gonna pull out a little stress element. So I've drawn a little square on here and pull that out. It might have a curved surface on top because I cut it from the outer edge. And on the right-hand side of my shaft, I've got, um, you know, looking at it from this direction or from the direction of the end, uh, looking in, I have a clockwise torque and as I can imagine how this would be applied to, to my little stress element that my cut, if my stress element is on the left-hand side of the cut, then my torque is gonna go across the face of it this way. And it's gonna be really hard for me to draw, but you can imagine I have a, a backside to this cube. So I have a torque, equal and opposite torque on the opposite side. And now the interesting thing about this, this torsional stress is that if you looked at this little 3D stress element that I've pulled out here, I've got one on the front, one on the back, but it's not in equilibrium, right? And why is that? Because it can rotate. These are both pointing in the same direction. Now it's in force equilibrium, one this way, one this way, so equal and opposite. My hands aren't on the screen, but you hopefully get what I'm saying. But it's not in rotational equilibrium. So to put it in rotational equilibrium, I would need to draw equal and opposite shear stresses on the front and back, uh, and that gives me equilibrium. So now my torsional stress 
has the equation tr by j. r is the radius of my shaft. Um, typically when we do these things we're applying torque to round shafts because they tend to um, do better. It's kind of an energy minimization type thing. Uh, if I apply a torque to a square shaft or a square thing, uh, there's a calculation and I don't have the equation in front of me, but basically you can find an equivalent radius, um, which is the equivalent circular shaft that would act the same as that square geometry. And that's normally what we would do for that. But I'm just going to stick to round shafts for this uh, example. So R is my radius. J is polar moment of inertia. And just like area moment of inertia is resistance to bending, polar moment of inertia J is a geomet geometric property that's resistance to twisting. So it's how, how well the geometry is going to resist being deformed um, in a twisting fashion. And you can probably already guess from this equation how my stress is distributed but if I look at that circular cross section and go out from there my stress increases linearly with radius as I increase R or radius I'm linearly increasing my stress so I get a plot that looks like this where my stress is a maximum at the outer surface of my shaft and zero at the very you know dead center of the shaft so that gives us um, our torsional stress. And of course, any component that we might look at might have any one of these four combinations of stress. 